Hello, this is Professor Otero at the School for International Studies at San Francisco University. Today, I will try to sum up the first half of Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, I will share my screen so that I can uh, uh, show you some graphs and the main points of Thomas Piketty. Um, so this is the outline. I will start uh, giving you a few inequality snippets, you know, some information about uh, how bad inequality is in 2021. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, capital in the 21st century, which is the title of Thomas Piketty's book. Uh, I will then move into the concepts that he proposes for an anatomy of capitalism. And finally, Piketty's four key findings in parts one and two of his book, which is roughly the first half of his book. Next week, I will talk about the second half. So some inequality snippets are as follows. Uh, 12 multinationals, particularly the ones that are identified as the high-tech companies, increased their fortunes by 40% since January of 2020, while 100 million more people joined the other 900 million that were already in poverty. So, uh, I mean, this time period coincides with the pandemic. And I mean, that is one of the ironies of the pandemic, a lot of more People went poor while at the same time, a handful of multinationals uh, saw their fortunes increase by a lot. And the, the 12 millionaires who together own over 1 trillion US dollars saw their fortunes increase by double digits during the first six months of the pandemic. Um, so one example, perhaps the more notorious one, is uh, the case of Je Jeff Bezos, who is the founder uh, of uh, Amazon. He owned $115 billion already by January of 2020, and 204 billion after six months of the pandemic. That is an increase of $89 billion. So other examples in billions of net worth as of 2020 of these people, Jeff Bezos, 204, Bill Gates, 114, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and creator of Facebook, uh, Warren Buffet, Elon Musk, you can read the numbers there, uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, Larry Ellison, Larry Page, Sergio Brin, Alice Walton, Jim Walton, and Rob Walton. The last three are uh, siblings and heirs of the founder of Walmart. So inequality in the United States in 2010, and moving back a decade here, uh, because that is the the timeline that uh, Tom Spiketty was looking at in his book, which was published in 2014 in English. Uh, it was published a year earlier in, in French. So the richest 10% of the population own 72% of America's wealth, while the bottom half claim just 2%. I guess it's worth at this point to mention something about why are we talking primarily about the United States? Well, the fact is that the United States continues to be the central economy of the world economic system. And whatever happens in the United States tends to reverberate around the world. In particular, its economic model has been transferred to the rest of the world 
particularly starting in the 1990s. I mean, the, the influence started in the 1980s in many places, but it was by, I would say, the late 1990s that uh, the neoliberal model of uh, economic development was really transferred to much of the rest of the world. So by looking at what happens in the United States, we can roughly anticipate what may happen in other countries if we are to continue with the same kind of economic model. So this is uh, U.S. inequality in 2010, real and imagined. Uh, and so this graph was constructed by uh, these psychologists, uh, Dan Ariely and Michael Norton. And what they did is they studied the perceptions of income inequality in the United States. And uh, so what we have here is, uh, you know, the, the top uh, bar here get, uh, tells us what the actual distribution of wealth is, which indicates that the top 20% of richest Americans own 84% of the nation's total wealth. The remainder, which is, uh, I guess, 16%, that's split into the other 80% of the US population. Now, um, what is the respondents to the survey that the psychologists conducted? What is the, the respondents' estimated distribution? Well, they thought that um, the wealthiest 20% owned less than 60% of total wealth in the United States, while the other 42% uh, or so would be divided among the other 80% of the population. Uh, now, when asked the, uh, what would be the ideal distribution, this is what respondents uh, replied. The portion of well owned, wealth owned by the top 20% ought to be about 32%, 30%. And the rest should be distributed um, among the other 80%. So you can see here that there is a considerable mismatch between the actual distribution of wealth and the perceived distribution of wealth. And so this can be part of the explanation why people are not more enraged than they might be. Moving on to the second section, I start with the, an image that I mentioned to you last week, which uh, I took from uh, this week's The Economist, uh, mind you, the, I knew about this picture because uh, the online version of The Economist is published on um, Friday's uh, London time. So I was able to see it uh, Thursday evening last week. And, and I thought this picture was you know, really evocative of what's going on in the United States, which is, uh, in case you didn't know, uh, an elephant is the symbol of the grand old party, which is the official name of the Republican Party. And what the Republican Party is doing, both at the national, but especially at the state level, is uh, it's modifying a series of laws that are making, in, ma making it increasingly difficult for people to vote, particularly for lower income colored people. And so if they succeed in moving forward with these kind of restrictive policies, well, that is going to make a huge crack on the electoral democratic system. And so for The Economist, which is a conservative uh, news weekly based in London, this is the major danger to US democracy at the moment. So this is definitely related to what we've been reading from um, Heather Bushy's book on Unbound. 
So capital in the 21st century. Uh, he starts with a diagnosis of our economy, politics, and society. And uh, Piketty's main prediction is that inequality will deepen even in the midst of perfectly operating markets. The truth is that there are very far from perfectly operating markets because you know there's a lot of monopoly, there's a lot of oligopoly as we read uh, for these week's uh, readings. Um, but even if there were perfectly operating markets, Piketty comes up with the opposite of mainstream economics prediction. And this is why Boshi claims correctly, I believe, that Piketty's theory is, represents a, a paradigm shift or a paradigm revolution in the, fields, in the field of economics. Uh, why? Because it questions the entire American dream. So I would say that there are two Piketty's, two Thomas Piketty's. Piketty one is a straightforward Keynesian institutional economist but Piketty too, perhaps the most interesting, the one that comes up with this uh, paradigm shift is a progressive human rights thinker and advocate for whom economics, economics as a discipline needs social and political ideas rather than see itself as outside of society and politics. It needs to be re-embedded in society and politics. So Piketty's thesis is that capitalism in the 21st century is hurling toward even more extreme inequality. Inequality has existed in 300 years of capitalism's existence, but it's now poised to deepen. So the economic forces that Piketty um, is looking at is convergence or divergence. I mean, it's either one of these uh, economic forces. You know, if there is, if there were convergence in economic forces, then that would take society to lower levels of inequality. However, if there is divergence, then that would mean deepening inequality. And I will remind you of these charts that I presented to you last week uh, with examples of the North American uh, nations, Canada, Mexico, the United States. Uh, as I mentioned in the early 1990s, the question was, what was gonna happen if you put together three countries that are fairly different. Well, Canada and the United States, not so different, but between them and Mexico, there are considerable differences. So are they going to converge? And if they do, are they converging upwards or downwards? That's another possibility toward Mexico's level of development. Or are either are they diverging? So what the actual figures in terms of per capita domestic uh, gross domestic product, we see that there is a considerable degree of convergence between Canada, which is the red line, and the United States, which is the blue line. However, Mexico has diverged from those two neighbors, northern neighbors. It has, in terms of per capita gross domestic product, Mexico has mostly stagnated. And the growth that there was, was actually achieved prior to the formation of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which started in 1994. So this growth here is greater than the growth in this period. Now, I also, also showed you this, uh, the labor share of uh, the gross domestic product and I want to supplement this because I just want to make it very clear that this is an index, all right? And so what this means is that each country was equated to 
its own particular situation as of 1984. And then the question thereafter was, how did that share, labor share of the gross domestic product evolve afterwards? And <clears throat> we saw that only in the case of the United States was there a, a bit of a bump for that share in the late 1990s and up until 2001 or 2002, actually. Uh, thereafter, the labor share of income or gross domestic product started to decline. And by the end of the period, workers in all three countries had a lower share of gross domestic product than they did in 1994. Another way of looking at this is as follows. Uh, this is the percent that goes to labor in Canada, the percent that goes to labor in the United States, and the percentage of the total GDP that goes to labor in Mexico. So once again, I mean, this is very consistent with uh, what we saw above, uh, except that uh, one important difference here between the United States and Canada is that Canada's workers are able to appropriate a larger share of the GDP in their country than workers in the United States. That automatically tells you that there is greater inequality in the United States, and there is definitely much greater inequality in Mexico than in either the United States or in Canada. Um, we here we see once again, you know, that little bump in the case of the United States that we saw in the earlier figure. Uh, this was, you know, during the Bill Clinton years, and that started to fall again uh, during the George W. Bush administration and later. And this goes until <clears throat> 2018, more or less. So this is a figure that is also shown in your book. Um, I'm trying to determine. Uh, that, that figure in the book appears on page 127, only for the United States. It doesn't show the, the data for, um, for Canada and Mexico. Uh, the time span that it show, that's shown in the book is actually from 1975 to 2010. So this is a, a shorter time period, uh, more limited to you know, the period of the North American free trade agreements. Uh, and uh, I repeat that these data come from the Federal Reserve Economic Database. So these are all you know, very official data. So inequality in markets. And this was definitely one of the main topics that we read for today. And uh, what Piketty has to say is that divergence has nothing to do with market imperfection. On the contrary, the more perfect the capital market is, the more likely extreme inequality will increase. Says that much on page 27. This is a paraphrase, is not an exact quotation. Uh, so the second part of Piketty's thesis is, uh, well, the part one, <clears throat> that the market deepens inequality. Part two, society is governed by the top 1% born into wealth and privilege. This is contrary to economics thinking that a growth tide lifts all boats. So for Piketty, this amounts to the death of the American dreams assumptions, uh, which are roughly as follows. That basic freedoms uh, that we all enjoy or the Americans enjoy, uh, basic freedoms to move up, that hard work will help the talented to move forward. I mean, that is the basis of meritocracy. That birth does not determine your station in life that markets will rise the worthy 
up. I mean, all of these still part of meritocracy. And all of these ensure promise of American dream. So Piccadilly's challenge to the economics discipline goes as follows. Economics can't help us understand the real economy. Uh, political economy was intertwined with history, social values, institutions, and political power. And yet, as we read a couple of weeks ago in uh, Thomas Mitchell's book, uh, he also anticipated how the rise of economics in the 1940s amounted to separating the economy and economics from the rest of society and you know leaving it to the experts whereas you know some of the founders of economics i mean adam smith and karl marx were both historians sociologists and moral philosophers and piketty would argue that we need more economists like them that define themselves more as political economists than economists that disembed the economy from the rest of society. So Piketty versus Marx. Piketty, in the early part of his book, critiques Marx about the capitalist collapse that he anticipated. And yet he ends up describing a different kind of apocalypse as a real possibility. So even though Piketty starts by critiquing Marx, and by the way, something that actually bothered me a lot is that he did not provide a single citation or quotation Marx. Rather, he assumed that everybody believed that he had read Marx and he was in the full right of critiquing him. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. I think he misconstrues some of Marx's uh, uh, theses, but be that, that as it may, Piketty ends up with a roughly 80% agreement with Marx in the sense that uh, if Marx would completely expropriate the means of production, from capitalists, Piketty would expropriate 80%, at least in terms of the top marginal rate of taxes. So that means that, uh, you know, for, and this will be defined differently in each society, uh, perhaps the first $200,000 uh, are taxed at a lower rate but above 200,000 or maybe 300,000, you know, and that will change depending on the time, that top marginal tax will vary. And Piketty's suggestion, as also Bushy's suggestion, so, uh, Bushy uh, cites authors that uh, considered that 83% would be the optimal rate of top maximum, uh, top marginal tax. So, I mean, there is debate there. <clears throat> Sorry. So, what are the concepts that Piketty suggests for conducting an anatomy of capitalism? Uh, I'm not sure if you can identify this picture here, but it is a uh, uh, depiction of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, who was his psychic. Don Quixote de la Mancha, that's uh, based on a novel, a 16th century novel by Miguel Cervantes de Saavedra, you know, one of the major classics in world literature. And um, Don Quixote was an idealist, among other things. Uh, that, that's the reason why I'm uh, putting up his uh, picture there, because of the conclusions that uh, Piketty reaches, which, like I said, I think he has a considerable degree of coincidence, ultimately, with Marx. Um, 
So parts one and two present basic concepts on what Piketty terms the laws of movement of capitalism. A key question is which parts of the national income go to capital and which go to labor? Uh, and this, of course, was also a key problem for Marx. And as we can tell from the figures I just showed you a moment ago, these are also questions that are in the back of the mind, minds of the economists that work in the uh, Federal Reserve, you know, constructing its databases, because they consider it to be, you know, a fundamental split in the economy. How much of a share does labor get? How much of a share does capital get? And it is definitely concerning that labor share is declining. So Piketty's research problem is, what is the right split between capital and labor? Can we be sure that an economy based on the free market and private property always and everywhere leads to an optimal division as if by magic? In an ideal society, how would one arrange the division between capital and labor? So here's how Piketty defines capital or wealth. I mean, those two things are basically the same for Piketty, which is a considerable difference with Marx, but I'm not going to go into the differences. Uh, so for Piketty, he says, and this is a direct quote from page 48, I define national wealth or national capital as the total market value of everything owned by the residents and governments of a given country at a given point in time, provided that it can be traded on some market. So that last point is important because, you know, whatever we define as wealth uh, or capital must be tradable in some market. <clears throat> so national income would be similar to GDP as defined in our class last week. National income is defined as the sum of all capital available to the residents of a given country in a given year, regardless of the legal classification of that income. So here we will go into well, that second point uh, gives us a little bit of a breakdown of uh, you know, the different classifications of uh, return on capital. So the capital to income ratio, Piketty says, historically has been anywhere between six to one to seven to one. So the capital income ratio varies uh, in that range, meaning six to seven times more capital than the yearly income generated in each country. So the legal forms of return on capital, which I'm uh, coding as K here, are profits, rents, dividends, interest, royalties, and capital gains. Let me uh, introduce a qualification here about the word rents, because the word rents is used in two different senses, uh, both in Piketty and definitely in Heather Bosch's book. Um, rents in this particular context is used to refer, for instance, to apartment rentals or uh, storage rentals, building rentals, like uh, you know where I'm sitting right now at Harbor Center, this is a rental space for which Simon Fraser University pays to the landlord. I'm not sure who the landlord is, but that landlord gets rents from Simon Fraser University. 
the other meaning of the word rent, um, I believe in, in the case of uh, Heather Bush's uh, book, she calls it economic rent. And what that means is a profit above and beyond the average rate of profits. So another way of calling that would be super profits. Or you can also refer to this as a technological rent. I guess that would be the kind of motivation that uh, Sean Peter would have been thinking of in the 1940s when he wrote uh, his book. Uh, um, his book was called something like uh, Socialism and Democracy. But that's where he talked about uh, uh, creative destruction. That's cited by, by Bushi. And um, what he meant there was that uh, he, he was not averse to monopolies, you might recall. Uh, but that's because he thought that monopolies would have this incentive of continuing with innovation because that would generate even further economic rents or technological rents meaning super profits or profits above and beyond the average rate of profits. Uh, later economists have really questioned that theory and you know we will be discussing this uh, next week when this class goes into small group discussions to uh, dissect uh, Bush's chapters. So capitalism's three main concepts in the formulations of uh, Thomas Piketty, oops, sorry. Uh, so first, the capital income ratio, which I already talked about. Then the share of capital in income, we talked about a little, a little bit. And then the rate of return on capital. Notice that each is a slightly different thing. <clears throat> The first point refers to how much capital is there as compared to the annual income generated by a society or an economy. And then the second point refers to how that income is split between capital and labor, the share of capital in income, which by the way, constitutes the basis for retaining the capital income ratio at anywhere between six to one or seven to one. That one being the yearly income in any given economy. And then the return on capital. <clears throat> so I'm gonna be breaking that down uh, momentarily, the rate of return on capital. Uh, so rather than focusing on profits like Marx did, Piketty adds the rates of all forms of capital income, including interest in the case of finance capital. So the first fundamental law of capitalism is alpha equals the rate of return times the capital income ratio. So I will be breaking this down uh, this formula is a pure accounting identity, says Piketty. It is tautological in the sense that it is, you know, kind of circular, and which is true in any society at any time by definition. So let me break that formula down, define its terms. Alpha is the share of income from capital in national income. Beta is the capital income ratio, which measures the yield on capital over the course of a year, regardless of its legal form. Once again, profits, rents, dividends, interest, royalties, capital gains, etc. And R represents the rate of return on capital. So once again, the formula is alpha, the share of income from capital in national income equals the rate of return multiplied by the capital income ratio. So historically, 
typical orders of magnitude. I've said this before. Uh, well, the first part at least uh, are that beta constitutes about 600% to 700%. Alpha is about 30%. And the rate of return on capital is about 5%. So at the micro level, when companies distribute more of their total revenue to stock owners in the form of profits than to workers in the form of wages, that may become the possibility of an inflammatory situation. I mean, if this kind of situation continues more or less uninterruptedly as it has for the past 30, 40 years, well, that could become an inflammatory situation at the micro level. So uh, the anatomy of wealth, key questions, and this is one of two slides with key questions, meaning there's gonna be about six questions in total. The first three are as follows. What type of capital, land, machinery, financial assets, or private homes, which of those types of capital have the most value? That would be one question to address in trying to define the anatomy of capital. Is wealth mostly private or public? Second key question. Third, is it high or low relative to wages? Because of course, wages constitute labor income. Right? The balance of that would be capital income. So is capital income high or low relative to wages? Last three sets, or last three questions. Um, the fourth is, is capital growing or diminishing as a share of the overall economy? And of course, if it is growing as a share of the overall economy, that probably means that inequality is deepening. If it is diminishing, that means that we are in a redistributive period that favors labor. What share of national income goes to the income derived from capital and what share goes to the wages paid to labor? How much inequality of income and wealth exists and why does it all matter? So Piketty's four big findings in part one are as follows. And well, I start with this graph, which uh, gives us different figures uh, from those from Bushy. I think Bushy had 290 here, something like that. I mean, this figure represents um, how much the chief executive officers get paid compared to average worker salaries. So in 1983, that share was less than 50 times, less than 50 times more the average worker. Well, by 2013, according to this uh, graph, which I took from Business Week, uh, that figure would be 331. Mind you, these are all averages, all right? There are companies, some companies, I would imagine Amazon is probably one of them, where the chief executive officer makes more than a thousand times more than the average worker, all right? I'll tell you that in the 1960s, 1970s, some management thinkers, I'm thinking of Peter Drucker here, and remember that I studied management for my undergraduate business administration. And one of the main management theorists was Peter Drucker. He thought that chief executive officers should not get anything more than 20 times the average worker, which contrasts, I mean, that's, you know, big enough or high enough, but at that time in Japanese culture, seven times more was considered okay. Anything more than seven times the average worker pay was considered uh, really problematic. 
But imagine now 331 times in the United States, and in some cases, a thousand times more than the people who are actually creating the value. So, <clears throat> pick these four big findings in parts one and two are as follow. Number one, and notice that I'm saying findings, okay? What I mean by that is that he comes to these conclusions after the exploration of massive, massive amounts of data. I would argue that uh, one of the reasons why Piketty's book became an extremely rare case of a bestseller for an economics book is precisely the fact that he amassed an incredible amount of empirical data from several countries, mostly the United States, but also France. I mean, those were the, the two main countries for which he found comparable data, but also from um, England and several other uh, advanced uh, capitalist countries. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, massive because uh, this was from 1700s, from 1700 onwards. So, you know, for a chunk of about 300 years of capitalism, and that's as, as old as capitalism is, more or less. I mean, before 1700, what you had was mostly feudal society. So capital started around this time. So um, that's why Piketty's book is so extremely important. So the amount of wealth and returns to capital relative to income have remained high since 1700. Mainstream economics thought that the marginal productivity of capital declines as capital increases, suggesting a decline in capital as capitalism matures. Piketty finds the contrary, that capital is still the dominating factor in capitalism as it was in earlier eras. Second major finding, capital is overwhelmingly privately rather than publicly owned. So, I mean, there may be some cases where capital is publicly owned. Which are those cases? Well, I mean, if you live in British Columbia, you, and if you're renting, well, if you're renting, maybe you don't pay uh, a bill for uh, BC Hydro, but if, if you do have to pay uh, your utilities bill, you would be paying BC Hydro. BC Hydro is a provincial corporation. So that would be a publicly owned uh, corporation in capital. <clears throat> but there's not very much of that. I mean, if you go to China, you might find more uh, publicly owned capital, but there is a lot of capital in China that is privately held. Uh, so the fact that the state is controlled by a single political party does not exclude the fact that a lot of the capital is privately owned. And in fact, China is experiencing a considerable degree of inequality because it is based on capital and capitalism. However, state controlled. So Piketty's four big findings in parts one and two continued uh, number three, the composition of capital changed dramatically from land-based to equally invested in corporate and financial assets, resources underground like oil and minerals and private homes. So the capital income ratio has been relatively stable since 1700 at about six to seven to one, as we had been talking about earlier. And so capitalism is thus deepening inequality. So uh, Piketty's main point. In the process of capital accumulation, no natural force 
avoids its concentration in centralization. And here I just clarify that that particular term, concentration and centralization, actually comes from Marx. Uh, but this is a term that Piketty doesn't use, all right? Uh, but Piketty's point is that only political forces can change the course and the increase of capital share of national income alpha. So if you let market forces do their work, all they're going to achieve is the same that has been happening before, which is deepening inequality. Sorry. So, say Spigotty, um, progress toward economic and technological rationality need not imply progress toward democratic and meritocratic rationality. The primary reasons for this is simple. Technology, like the market, has neither limits nor morality. And that is it for today. I guess uh, you can interpret this as you know, the growing power of capital stepping over people. And uh, mind you, interestingly, I took this image from The Economist. Uh, it's really surprising to me how these conservative uh, newspaper, as the economist likes to call itself, uh, sometimes conveys pictures that are really revealing of how inequitable capitalism is. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to stop my share here and stop the report.